Okay, this lecture is going to be about the non-organic food uh, herbicide glyphosate. Okay, um, here is glycine. It's an amino acid. It is the smallest amino acid. Every amino acid kind of looks like a plus sign with the carbon in the center being the alpha carbon. It's always going to have an acid on one side. That's why it's called an acid. And it's going to have an amino group on the other side. That's why it's called an amino acid. Proteins are made out of amino acids. Then it will have a hydrogen located above the carbon. And then this is the variable part. It's called the R group. And that, for glycine, is just a hydrogen. So it's the smallest amino acid, the uh, glycine. And that's why it's very good in enzyme active sites, because it creates space by the lack of a, a side chain other than hydrogen. Now here's glyphosate. And what's interesting about it is it's very much like glycine. If you look at it, it has essentially the structure of an amino acid with just a hydrogen for its side chain. So in that sense, it's exactly like glycogen. And then here's the nitrogen, which corresponds to the amino group over here for glycine. And then here's what's different about it. There's a methyl group, as you can see its name, methyl. And then adjacent to that is a phosphate group, phospho. So it starts out its name N-phosphomethylglycine. Okay, you can call it phosphonal, but phospho is easier. So the phosphate and the methyl group are attached to the nitrogen, the amino side of this molecule. So glyphosate is the name we all know it by, but just so you know, N-phosphomethylglycine is its other name. But the key point is, it's basically a glycine with this other stuff stuck onto it, so it can substitute out for glycine in making proteins. And that's a big thing that uh, uh, Dr. Stephanie Seneff will emphasize, and that will end up being very relevant to the discussion of glyphosate. Now here is a electron transport chain within the inner mitochondrial membrane. So this is where most of the ATP is made in a cell. You can make 18 times as much ATP through electron transport, sending electrons down this chain, and then using creating a gradient and then harvesting the ATP over here with ATP synthase. Makes, you, know, you can get 36 ATP off of a glucose molecule versus only two through anaerobic glycolysis. So here's a normal appearance of the electron transport chain. And this is succinate dehydrogenase as part of complex two, and that's going to be very important because that gets inhibited by glyphosate. Okay? All right, so here's glyphosate inhibition of succinate dehydrogenase otherwise for our purposes known as complex two. And so the point I want to make is it's toxic to mitochondria. And by the way, all this work is coming from the book by uh, Stephanie Seneff called Toxic Legacy. So here you can see it, Toxic Legacy by Stephanie Seneff, PhD, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology researcher, brilliant lady, and uh, she's done a lot of work. She's got tons of videos on the internet. Stephanie Seneff, you can look her up. Okay, um, so that's a key point. Mitochondria inhibitor. Anything that inhibits mitochondria is bad. And then one of the key points I want to make is trying to see the whole big picture together. So we just talked about glyphosate inhibiting complex 2. We talked about cadmium inhibiting complex 3. Excessive dietary fat inhibiting complex 3. Lead inhibiting cytochrome C and ATP synthase. Toxic aldehyde hydroxynonanol inhibiting ATP synthetase. F minus inhibiting complex four. And the point I'm making is this is always going on inside our bodies. And you can't completely avoid being exposed to these things. But what you can do is with a healthy diet and lifestyle, minimize this stuff. And this also explains why am I so meticulous about trying to do everything as healthy as I can. Because I know all this stuff is going on. And if your body, you know, our bodies are pretty robust. It's amazing all the stuff that they can, all the DNA they can repair, all the free radicals they can control. So you just want to help your body. But it's a big mistake to think everything's fine because it's not. There's always going to be some of these problems. You can't completely avoid exposure to a lot of this stuff. So you minimize it as best you can and you keep yourself healthy as best you can. Okay, non organic herbicide glyphosate. We'll talk about atrazine in another lecture. It's too much to talk about it in just one lecture. Okay, so here's her name, Stephanie Seneff. Just check her out on YouTube. She's got tons of interviews about her book. She's a brilliant lady. At first you see her, she seems a little awkward, you know, almost like an Asperger autistic lady. But then you start hearing her talk, and she's very intelligent. You'll be impressed. 
okay, corporations always say their product is safe. I mean, I've, I've been hearing this now. You know, when you're young, you actually believe stuff. But part of being intelligent is to be skeptical un until proven otherwise. And I can tell you, I have a friend who's a PhD, double postdoc, molecular biologist. And he was having his kids, he sold Christmas trees as a, as a hobby, a little side business. And he was having his kids paint uh, glyphosate, Roundup, onto the weeds that would grow, the vines that would grow into the Christmas trees. And I'm like, dude. You're having your kid working with a toxic herbicide. And he goes, oh, no, it's safe, it's safe. The company said it's safe. I said, you have your kids working with a toxic herbicide. Anything that kills all these plants is going to be toxic to any human species. Isn't that obvious? And he's like, oh, you know, I'm just a pain in the ass. You know, okay, you know what? That was stupid, okay? Um, so let's see. They've always said that. They say DDT was safe. When I was a kid, everyone thought x-rays were safe. I went to the shoe store and with my mother and you would they had a thing where you put your feet into the thing to uh to check the size of your feet and you get an x-ray of your foot uh stupid okay uh they say msg was safe aspartame tobacco f minus soy olive oil ah bs time goes by it'll be more obvious and anybody looks at it closely it's obvious already okay glyphosate is the main ingredient in the herbicide called roundup it is not allowed in organic food and that's the other point i want to make that's why i recommend eating only organic if possible i realize there might be some exceptions you're out at a special event and you don't want to be social okay fine you're at a business lunch fine but to the extent that you can try to avoid it and i avoid it a lot and i never get invited anywhere so i'm pretty good at avoiding it almost all the time okay glycine is the smallest amino acid. It's our group, we just talked about that as hydrogen. Glyphosate is an analog of glycine, meaning that it's structurally very similar. And GP, glyphosate, can get into the proteins by replacing glycine. And Stephanie Seneth, she emphasizes this. And again, I put the page numbers for TL, that means Toxic Legacy, her book, uh, because her book's kind of an incredible discussion of the biochemistry of glyphosate. It's a brilliant book. And all the page numbers are here, and you'll be amazed at how many problems are related to this. And this is a common mechanism of a pathogen, is to have a Trojan horse effect, whereby we talked about how F- replaces hydrogen in biological molecules, cadmium replaces calcium, aluminum can replace magnesium. Well, glyphosate replaces glycine, which is a very important thing. An essential, not an essential, but a key amino acid in lots of cellular processes, okay? Glyphosate does not belong in the human body. There's no purpose for it whatsoever in the human body. It's totally a synthetic thing. Uh, Senef also pointed out that glyphosate is sprayed onto uh, non-organic crops. So things that are not uh, non-GMO and non-organic. They have to be non-organic. They're not allowed to use an non-organic. But it's sprayed on things that you wouldn't think of. Um, as long as they're not organic, it's used as a drying agent, a desiccant. And this will be done, especially like in a cold place like Canada. They want to speed up the turnover on the crops because if they dry them out, they can harvest them more rapidly. And it includes things you wouldn't expect, wheat, oats, beans, peas. So uh, another point, only eat organic and you avoid all this stuff. Here's an example of some of the foods that are GMO and it gets sprayed on those as well. Corn, soy, canola, cotton, alfalfa, sugar beets. Uh, I'm going to be, like I said, very often just referring to things uh, Dr. Senna said because she's like the world expert on this. Um, it increases the risk of fatty liver and in her opinion, uh, increases the risk of diabetes. Um, it'll decrease the sulfation of endothelial cells, which decreases their ability to maintain an optimal zeta potential negative charge on their outer surface to repel RBCs and prevent clotting. Uh, you don't want clotting. That's why people die. They die from clotting in their brain, a stroke, clotting in their heart. That's a myocardial infarction. Okay. That's a key point. Everybody's worried about bleeding. No, it's, people don't die too often from bleeding. That hardly ever happens. They die from clotting and occluding arteries. Okay. Uh, Senef points out that GP was originally thought of primarily as an antibiotic. And it kills a lot of good gut bacteria. And that leads to leaky gut. Leaky gut leads to increased allergies, leads to increased risk of gluten sensitivity and celiac disease. There's also a subtype of GMO corn called BT corn. I think it was like Bacillus thuringiens. And that's based on like a 
toxic chemical from insects that irritates the gut lining and that can potentially increase the risk of allergies. Um, we don't need to go into all the pathophysiology, but uh, GP, we're going to just say GP for now, and it's too long to say glyphosate, can cause a decrease in intestinal paracelsis because of its pH effects in the colon, and that will lead to uh, slowing down of gut motility, and that can lead to SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, because uh, the transit times decreased. Okay. Um, GP inhibits the shikimate uh, pathway, and what everybody thought was that shikimate pathway is just in bacteria, so it should not be toxic to humans, and that's an additional reason why people believed it was really safe at first. But the problem is our good gut bacteria, they're sort of symbiotic with us. We actually do need them to do stuff. They help make the aromatic amino acids like phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. They help make uh, the B vitamins, B1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, and 12. Um, so like I said, Senna pointed out that GP substitution for glycine and proteins is a major mechanism of GP pathology. Um, it's basically like a chronic slow poisoning, kind of like F- minus, and these things over time decrease a person's health. We can handle them to a reasonable extent, but the older you get, the more fragile you get, the less able you are to handle all this stuff. Um, she says it's also associated with hypothyroidism. Again, if you want to look this stuff up, here's the page numbers in the book. Um, thyroid hormone is made from tyrosine, which comes from the shikimate pathway. So what she's saying is, her understanding of it is that the body becomes relatively deficient in some of these amino acids that are needed for things because uh, of the uh, GP uh, either chelating them, binding to them, and keeping them away from us so we're not able to use them for our metabolism or because of other problems caused by uh, GP. GP is also estrogenic, so it increases the risk of breast cancer, it increases the risk of infertility, it increases the risk of polycystic ovary syndrome. So this is one more thing to avoid if you're trying to get pregnant, if you're trying to heal yourself from PCOS. Um, we showed in that earlier picture, it inhibits uh, succinate dehydrogenase, which is a part of both Krebs cycle in the mitochondrial matrix, and then it's really part of the intermitochondrial membrane, so it's part of the electron transport chain as well. It's, it straddles both cycles, Krebs cycles and electron transport hyphen oxfos. Okay, um, we know that it's thought to potentially increase the risk of breast cancer, and in particular, she quotes a Seralini paper where when they fed it to the mice for a more prolonged amount of time, they started to see more uh, breast tumors. In 2015, this international uh, health community declared that GP was a probable carcinogen. There's been a bunch of lawsuits of people claiming that non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, otherwise known as NHL, uh, was related to GP. Um, infant formulas might contain GP. If an infant formula is not organic and it's based on soy, it's GMO soy sprayed with GP, there's a chance you're going to have... Uh, GP, you know, some poor baby's formulas, you know. So I actually really think women should have more time off after a baby so they can nurse the kid adequately. So a lot better for a baby to be nursed with a healthy mom, you know, low-fat vegan mom's breast milk than it is with these, you know, they're in aluminum can a lot of times. They're probably leaching aluminum into the stuff. BPA inner lining, BPA being leached into the formula. Um, GP in there. They used to even put MSG in these formulas, which can cause excitotoxicity of the hippocampus and the brain, possibly the hypothalamus as well, F minus. So poor kid, what a tough way to start out a life, you know? Okay, some of the effects of GP on the body. By the way, when I say body, I mean from the head down. The head is sort of like, and the spine or like the central nervous system, sort of a separate system in the body. Uh, okay, GP gets in the tap water. And by the way, over time, the, the weeds become more resistant to it. So they keep spraying more and more, up to 10 times more. And that means more of it's accumulating in the environment, more of it's getting into the tap water. Uh, plus, what they spray onto the plants is a formulation with additives in there, adjuvants that make it more powerful than in some simple reductionist research study where they're only going to be GP. There's actually more than GP, things that potentiate the effects of GP what's used out in the wild. 
Seneff also points out that collagen, a key protein, all our connective tissue, the glue that holds the body together, every third amino acid is glycine, and she thinks that GP is being substituted for some of these glycines and that it's disrupting the optimization of collagen, and that can cause, in her opinion, she thinks possibly chronic pain syndromes. I don't know if that's true, but that's what she says. An interesting idea. F-minus did something similar to that. Okay, Seneff is... Uh, she says that she thinks, in her opinion, based on studying it, that it's contributing to the decrease in the number of bees available in the environment, which is potentially bad. It can lead to less pollination of plants. That's not good for us, not good for our food supply. Uh, Seneff says that GP is, in her words, definitely one of the causes of fatty liver. It appears to disrupt this pathway here. And the persons that have more GP in the urine are more likely to have fatty liver. But the way I would see it is a person who's eating non-organic food is eating more junk food typically, and they're going to also have more fatty liver. So I don't know for sure if that's causative. She did quote some studies that she believes indicate that it is. Oh, by the way, I mentioned it's in the water. You can remove it with reverse osmosis, but you're not going to remove it with a carbon filter, so just so you know that. Okay, um, has an excitotoxin effect on the brain. So it's one of the many excitotoxins, all right? Not good. It'll disrupt uh, some neuronal calcium metabolism. Not good. Excitotoxin, not good. All these things, they'll increase metabolic demand of the brain neurons. And if you couple them, like we talked about, things like a high-fat diet, high-sodium diet, your same old story, you're dropping blood supply to the brain while you're ramping up metabolic demand. You don't want to do that. Not good for brain cells. They might go into apoptosis and die. This might lead to decreased cognitive performance, decreased cognitive function, decreased IQ, uh, potentially. Autism, she, Seneff, strongly believes that uh, GP is associated with autism. She makes multiple claims and cites many papers in her book relative to that. She believes it's also associated with ADHD and anxiety. Um, she claims that the rise of autism and GP is somewhat parallel. She claims in animal studies, tissue culture and rats, that there's a decrease in neuronal arborization, meaning making dendrites on the cell body, so less receptivity to other neuronal connections, which indicates it'll decrease cognitive function. She thinks the same is happening in children with autism. Perhaps she says that GP can chelate uh, cobalt and lead to a vitamin B12 deficiency. Vitamin B12 deficiency can cause cognitive impairment if it's not diagnosed. Um, she mentioned that the lack of these amino acids, these aromatic amino acids in particular, phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan, can cause problems with neurotransmitter synthesis. She says that GP can get into the brain, it can cross the blood-brain barrier. It also can decrease glutathione availability, which is an important part of our antioxidant system, leading to decreased ability to uh, detoxify free radicals, oxidants, and that could be harmful to the brain. Okay, hippocampal excitotoxins. We'll talk about it in another lecture, but just be aware glyphosate's on that list, and these are not good. These are all things that can decrease brain function. Okay, as far as references, here's the book by uh, Stephanie Seneff right here, and here's a bunch of papers uh, about the things we talked about, and there's tons more, but that's, that's, that's it for today. I hope that was helpful.